Let's talk about the Global Maritime Anti-Corruption Network. Together with the Convention on Business Integrity of Nigeria, says a total of 455 corruption incidents were recorded at the Nigerian seaports between 2019 and 2021. And that was contained in a new report on anti-graft activities released a few days ago by the two organizations. Joining me live here in our Abuja studios is Soji Apampa, who is the co-founder and CEO of the Convention on Business Integrity. And visiting from Denmark is a former ship Master and Associate uh, Director, Global Operations and Industry Engagement, uh, the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network, Vivek Menon. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you very much for making the time just to be on the show. So, G, let me start with you. Tell me more about this latest anti-corruption report in Nigeria's shipping and maritime sector. Are things looking better? Things are looking better, especially for vessels in the area of vessel clearance. Um, shipmasters are able to come to Nigeria with less trepidation than they used to have in the old days. Things are now getting more predictable. They now understand the standard operating procedures. They have greater expectation that those procedures will be followed by the officials they meet. And that if there is a problem, that there is a help desk which is banned by CBI, that MACN, the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network, has this help desk that will support them, but through the great interventions of the Nigeria Shippers Council and all of the different agencies at the ports. Mm. Very interesting, and I'm going to come back to you in just a second, but let me ask uh, Vivek about the global picture around the maritime industry. Is corrupt, are corrupt practices uh, in this industry, what makes it attractive, uh, globally speaking, when you talk about graft uh, in terms of shipping, in terms of maritime, the officials who are involved in investigations, clearing and all of, and things of that? Thank you. Thank you for having us. Another great question. I think we need to understand shipping in a larger value chain, if I may put it that way. And if you want to call it a cradle to grave journey of a ship, a uh, ship is born, it operates, and then it eventually has to expire its services. So in all this value chain, there are various touch points to individuals. And this is where it gives rise to opportunities because it's also regulated very heavily. It, uh, trans it, it transforms into various cross uh, national regulatory ref uh, re like re regulatory spaces as well and that gives an opportunity for individuals to actually interpret the national laws to their choosing and therefore it gives rise to opportunities of integrity risks and that is what we've been working on with the introduction of the UK Bribery Act 10 11 years ago this is when the MACN was also formed mm -hmm. shipping industry had to understand how best they can take an active role so it's a very industry-led initiative that started the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network. And what they wanted to simply do is, with the processes that they are doing on a daily basis, how can they best do ethical business? And uh, what that meant for everybody, for even you and I, is the cost of what we buy in the shops today can also be a fair price. So the vision was basically to ensure that maritime business is fair and it actually contributes to everybody at a fair price as well. So the whole business ethics was uh, was driving. Uh, because the, with the shipping network. and maritime, Vivek, you're talking about the global supply chain, logistics Correct. and what have you. Uh, you're a former shipmaster, so you understand this practices among among your colleagues and in, yes. in our countries is it is it in, when you talk about jurisdictions do we have this practice is much more in certain jurisdiction than the others in some jurisdictions yes it is and it is more that's what we call them as high risk uh, jurisdictions or high risk ports even in a country not all all ports uh, may be uh, feeling the same way so when you come in with a ship in certain jurisdictions it is definitely a high risk and it's simply because we don't have a choice so when you come in and you don't have a choice, you succumb to the demands that are being made by certain individuals mm. of certain agencies. Again, it's not to say everyone in all the agencies are the same way. It is certain individuals mm. in certain agencies who choose to uh, do certain practices. Are, are we seeing, or are you surprised, uh, Soji, about the, the declining demand for graft by government officials at the ports? How long have we come down this road to get to this point? I will say that um, in terms of the timeline, yeah. we're talking since 2012 that the interventions have been going on. Mm. But the marked decline that we're recording mm. has been since really 2020 that we saw it. So in 2019, we had the highest demand, but it fell from like 266 demands 
to 128 demands in 2020 and only 51 so far this year and i think it corresponds with certain activities that were put in place by the government number one we applied to the presidency at the start of 2019 that the level of corruption was still too high and then they uh, put this to the anti-corruption commission the icpc which then started with a shippers council to run sting operations and these were now um, constituted into a port standing task team comprising of icpc shippers council ports authority and dss catching those who are culprits red-handed while it was going on so already by about july august 2020 we were already seeing some arrests and the jitters were already reverberating through the system then in december the vice president then launched a port process manual that says this is the timeline for you to do this particular process this is how it should operate and so on and then mandated the shippers council to be the enforcer along with this standing task team and then we saw the numbers have dropped so although corruption is there lurking somewhere it's not manifesting as commonly as it used to manifest be i think attributable to some of these provisions in, in a manner of speaking the administration the current administration has put its foot on the ground when it comes to corrupt practices within the maritime and shipping now what we heard over the last uh, uh, few days was that the government has now said that the ship uh, uh, captains should no longer give uh, gifts and what have you to uh, to government officials moving forward as sort of raising that well let's talk about that when we when we return gentlemen uh hand around we'll be back we have uh, a whole lot more to discuss on the nigeria's uh, shipping and maritime in line with the latest anti-corruption report released by cbi and uh the other organization we'll have a lot more we have a uh, vivek morning here still with us in the studio we'll be right back everyone Oh yeah, welcome back to the show, everyone. A few days ago, the Nigerian government announced a ban on captains of ships, preventing them from prov providing gifts to the officials of customs, the Post Authority, and other shipping inspectors. Speaking to the uh, headline issue of anti-corruption in shipping and maritime business is Soji Apampa of the Convention on Business Integrity and Vivek Menon of the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network out of Denmark. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for standing by. Let's wrap up the conversation. Uh, in terms of where we are right now, quite a number of Nigerians tend to believe or think that corrupt practices in the maritime or shipping industry are not abating. Is this more of a perception than reality? Let me start with you, uh, Vivek. Yes, so it is, it is a two-sided coin. So there is someone who facilitates the whole process of corruption and then there's someone who is demanding. So what used to be a practice of gratification, let's say a pat on the back, if you want to call it that way, became a demand over a period of time. That means certain individuals, as I mentioned earlier, who, who are going to use their discretionary powers and misuse the regulations of the, of the nation are able to demand for such, uh, such things from a vessel or a captain of a vessel. And therefore, having no choice on board a vessel and in the interest of operating in good time so we all receive our goods in good time so that we don't have to pay too much to receive our goods in the shops they have to do what it takes to operate those vessels so that has been the practice and this is what the industry chose to change and uh, by joining uh, MACN they decided that we don't want to continue this practice but at the same time they we want to work with the public sector to see how we can see the change that we all want to see going forward so that's what I would like to uh, so, G, the latest uh, 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 the order given by the Nigerian authorities regarding uh, a ship captains uh, coming back and say, here is a bottle of uh, a few, a couple of, uh, for customs officials or other agencies, whatever, uh, MPA, whatever, and, and who have anything to do with clearing an inspection of vessels because uh, we talk about a vessel this is a whole lot of thing it could be that it could be arms it could be ammunition it could be a whole lot of things uh, yeah. uh, good drugs hard drugs whatever it is so a ship is like a little bit like an aircraft in fact it carries a whole lot more so the whole lot could be hidden there so this gratification as vivid put it do you think this is the final um line of ensuring that this corrupt gratification practices that it says could now become a form of demand is this the final stop as it were 
No, I, I think what the Nigerian government has done was to signal that, look, we are cleaning our house up. If we catch any of you trying to muddy what we're cleaning up, we will hold you responsible. So it's a signal to the captains that, look, if you really didn't want to give any of these things before, you're, we're on your side. Don't give. But if we catch you giving, then you're just as guilty as these officials we're going after. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a very loud signal to the industry that Nigeria is cleaning house. I, 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 what's the role of technology here, Vivek, to talk to me about how do you, I'm not too sure you're going to be able to go after everyone. So technology comes into play. Absolutely. And I think this is where we have an opportunity. I believe that technology can potentially remove the human interaction. Of course, it doesn't necessarily eliminate everything. There could be other opportunities for people who want to look at corruption in that uh, angle from mm. a technology perspective. But definitely, human-to-human -human interface, but that happens regularly on board vessels, can be eliminated or at least reduced drastically for the opportunities for corruption through technology. So we see that in many other countries where port clearance processes, vessel clearance processes are done well before the vessel comes. And all they have to do is to check vessels that they want to question more in detail. They don't have to go through each vessel in that de uh, in, uh, from an inspection point of view. So definitely technology plays a positive role. And we believe that uh, that's a good opportunity for countries uh, that want to pursue that direction. So G, in terms of logistics, getting into the ports and getting out, essentially with Nigerian Ports Authority, which is the, uh, uh, and the customs, which are the two main agencies in, in, in the seaport business in Nigeria, seems to be very Herculean. And the whole uh, process of trying to load cargoes and get them out, in terms of maritime shipping, uh, ships turn around time within the Nigeria's uh, waters and, and all of that, still a bit Herculean. So is it all boiled down to uh, corrupt graft practices or we have infrastructure and other issues to deal with? No, there are, there are a great number of issues. Um, yes, corruption is one issue. Inefficiency is another issue. But um, I think also the operating procedures. For instance, in the old days, it would take 142 signatures to get a vessel in and out of the port. That has been drastically reduced now by introducing standard operating procedures and the port process manual that says exactly what steps are required and who is to be involved with it. And that is what Shippers Council is implementing. And let me give you an example. So last Friday, the NPPM gave a report to the Honorable Minister of Transport where they mentioned that whereas some of the terminals were only positioning 100 odd um, containers for customs inspection, for joint inspection, yes. but now by enforcing the port process manual, they are now doing 200. So by enforcing certain processes, insisting that Customs shouldn't review first, yeah. then another agency, but you must do joint inspection. Yeah. That that is what the process manual calls for. It's cutting down the time mm -hmm. and increasing the productivity. So, yes, there are some inefficiencies, but we know that there are infrastructural challenges as well, like the scanners and road yeah. networks. Logistics, and so supply on. issues yeah. yes. within Nigeria's, uh, uh, and, and indeed across Africa. If you look at East Africa, for example, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, moving trucks and whatever, the customs issues are still a whole lot of viva. Do you think we have a big problem here in terms of how many agencies want to inspect it? particular container or a particular truck or a particular vessel because it looks like everybody sees it as uh, a very juicy business yes so definitely there are bottlenecks and uh, there was a recent report by UNCTA the United Nations uh, trade facilitation body that talked about mm. referring to the AFTA agreement and so on uh, so whatever measures we take if we were able to increase transparency in how to do daily work if you're able to ensure that there is a consistency in using those standard operating procedures or whatever the procedures may be, if we can then, with those two measurements, can predict time and cost for any transaction, it could be a vehicle moving from A to B, then I think what they're trying to say is that 33% uh, intra-Africa trade can be increased and the deficit of 51% that Africa has in terms of trade can be reduced. I think that's what they summarized that whole report. So definitely by increasing transparency and consistently applying some of these standard operating procedures, in addition to the infrastructure challenges, yes, we, we are familiar with that, but by addressing only corruption, 
um, we may not solve everything, but it's one of the fundamental areas that we want to focus on. So, um, so there is a lot of scope, as much as there are challenges uh, in, in Africa in general. Yes, so if, if we reduce uh, corrupt practices, you think it will enhance our ease of doing business? Absolutely. I strongly believe that uh, it is one of the, personally I believe it's one of the strongest bottleneck because if you look at it in any, uh, any side of the supply chain, there are touch points. Again, whether we want to bring in technology or want to use procedures that will simplify trade flows, it is a huge opportunity. So, yeah, I think you need to expand what CBI is doing, what conventional business integrity is need to involve, to include some of those processes, by the way. If you succeeded <laughs> so much on anti-corruption side, I think we need to hand you a few more, add more plague to say the, the, the result of hard work is more it's hard more work. work. So I'm adding more to what you got to do. Thank you, gentlemen, for Thank being here. Thank you very here, much. Uh, for Thank you so very much. much. So, Jack Pampa of CBI and uh, Vive uh, Menon of the Maritime Anti-Corruption uh, Network. Thank you for your time and see you some other time.